We are here, all three, for this live broadcast of the Twist Podcast. We hope you're ready for some science. We have a whole bunch of news ahead. Uh, let us know if Justin is lagging because he's on Wi-Fi, and we'll see if that works for us. It's working right now. I, he can he can sense me um, already. Making fun of his Wi-Fi, anyhow. <laughs> we're hey, gonna do hey. this. <laughs> it's just going to be the delayed reaction, the slow on the uptake, Justin. Today, <laughs> I'll just try to anticipate uh, when you guys say something, and I'll start anticipate right then. Patient. Hey, okay. Oh. Paid each other's. <laughs> Sandwiches? <laughs> what? Yes. Yeah. All right, everyone. As we get started, I hope you know that if you're subscribed to this, this is the live thing and all the stuff here is happening live. No editing. There's no magic except for the magic of the internet and StreamYard, which we use for our broadcast. But the podcast will be edited for brevity so that we hit our tight 90. Um, and I guess that's it. Let's do the show. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, let's do this. All right. Is everyone ready? We shall begin. How did that not go all the way over? Hold on. I'm editing in two places, apparently. And it doesn't like me. All right. Dun dun dun. Beginning the show in a three, a two. This is twists this week in science episode number 878 recorded on wednesday june 1st 2022 how to make a big old science omelet hey everyone i'm dr kiki and tonight on the show we will fill your head with axolotls spider and poop but first disclaimer 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 on Memorial Day, we were supposed to have been remembering the fallen soldiers, those who were called to serve and sacrificed all. But instead, another massacre of children with an assault rifle has people remembering that the United States is the most violent, dangerous place on Earth. 14 mass shooting events over the Memorial Day weekend. Another one at a hospital in Oklahoma just today. And as the yearly deaths by gun in the United States continue to climb, 45,222 in 2020 alone, we are far exceeding our fallen soldiers in war. Eclipsing the lives lost by our troops in the eight years in Iraq, 20 years in Afghanistan, and the Korean War combined in a single year. Approaching every soldier's life lost in the 20-year Vietnam War every single year. And why? because guns are poorly regulated in the United States. States that are well-regulated have the fewest gun deaths, but gun deaths are higher in the U.S. than anywhere else in the world. We use guns to commit homicide and suicide per capita more often than anywhere else on the planet. Guns are the number one cause of death amongst children in the United States. Memorial Day is a day to remember our fallen. We should remember who that is even as we enjoy another episode of This Week in Science, coming up next. I've got the kind of mind I can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. anticipate but i'm not really sure how soon i should be correcting for the lag ah good one kiki are you aware that you're <laughs> muted because i don't <laughs> i was trying to like do it now do it now oh, okay <laughs> 
<laughs> I didn't hear Justin very well on that. So give us a good science, Justin. Good science to you, Kiki and Blair. And a good science to you too, Justin, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. Hopefully this week will be more full of science than it is of bloopers. But, you know, it's always good for our twist blooper reel, which I know somebody is putting together out there. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I hope you really are looking forward to a good show of science because I have brought liver transplants, electric evolution, and exercise. We're going to exercise tonight on the show. Ready? What do you have for us, Justin? I've got, uh, you know, just replacing the liver is fine. I've got a regenerative model that can replace everything. 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 Uh, as oh. well as a major extinction event in history. Also, a, an ancient city that was risen from the waters and an ancient city that was overgrown and discovered by flying lasers. Flying lasers? Ancient mm -hmm. cities and flying lasers. Mm -hmm. This is the next adventures of Justin Jackson. Blair, what's in the animal corner? Oh, my gosh. I have... Uh... Baboon courtship, spider courtship, and some poop. What else is new? <laughs> Just a normal courtship, week courtship, in the animal poop. corner. Courtship, yeah. courtship, poop. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is definitely stacking up to be a lot of good stories as we jump into the show. I do want to remind you that subscribing to Twist fairly easy to do. You can find us on all of the podcast platforms that you can probably think of out there. Just look for This Week in Science. We are on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch, where we broadcast live every Wednesday at 8 p.m. Pacific time. We are Twist, Sci Twist Science, T-W-I-S-C-I-N-C-E. -E. Um, yeah, Twitch, Twitter, and Instagram. And our website is twist.org. It's time for the science. <gasps> Let's talk about livers. Well, replacing them with transplants. And okay, what are the, we've talked about transplanting organs before. What is one of the big problems? Rejection. With, yeah, rejection. Another big problem. Donors. Uh, yeah, yeah. Supply chain. <laughs> gotta, Supp they gotta find a living, oh, uh, I guess. But not really for long. Yeah. And, then, and, and then you have to decide who deserves the organ more because there's not enough for everyone. Right. So Ooh, one way that people have been trying to solve this problem is through synthetic livers, trying to grow livers in Petri dishes, trying to grow them in the lab, make them de novo out of people's cells to get past the rejection issues, but this is still kind of futuristic science. Mm -hmm. A different attempt has been to make the livers that would be coming from potential donors last longer and also healthy them up a little bit so that they'll be good, healthy, basically brand new livers ready for transplantation, not on a rushed schedule, but can be planned and actually transplanted as needed when needed. Fewer livers going to waste. How would someone go about doing this? Well, out of the University of Zurich, uh, a team called Liver for Life has created a perfusion machine. And this perfusion machine does everything that the human body does. It gives it oxygen to replace the lungs. It pumps to replace the blood. It has a dialysis unit to perform the function of the kidneys for filtration. Um, it's got all these aspects of hormones and nutrients and all the things that a liver would need to be a nice, healthy liver. And so when somebody dies or and it, there is a liver available, it could potentially be put in this perfusion machine for a number of days and kept healthy. And what they have shown in their new press release and their, uh, their, their demonstration is that they were able to store a liver for several days outside of the body in their liver for life perfusion machine, and then transplant it into a, 
into a cancer patient who was on the waiting list for a liver transplant, but probably would not get a liver in time otherwise. They kind of said, hey, you're probably not going to get a liver in time, but we've got this other option for you if you want it. And it's been accept- it's been successful. I like I like how you put, put that. We've got this other option. So <laughs> you you mean my only option is you're, that other I, option? I, I, yeah, actually, it's your only I, option. So take it or die. Yeah. Up to you. Yeah, you could take it and it could work, or it could not, which is the same as not taking the option. So, <laughs> but it did work. Yeah, it did Woo. work, and the liver that they had put into the perfusion machine was actually not a really healthy liver to begin with, but it came out a much healthier liver and was uh, was well accepted by the uh, organ recipient. And they just published in Nature Biotechnology their work where it shows that by treating livers in the perfusion machine, it's possible to alleviate the lack of functioning human organs and save lives. They also go on to say, uh, go on to say, The interdisciplinary approach of solving complex biomedical challenges embodied in this project is the future of medicine. This will allow us to use new findings even more quickly for treating patients. And so uh, this project was actually launched in 2015. um, And it's, yeah, it's a little rolling, it's like a little rolling liver trolley. It's like a little aquarium, but instead of fish or lobsters, it's, you know, livers. Livers. And the livers, the livers can go on to live happy and healthy lives (laughs) in their new recipients. But I, I, I love that this gets rid of the big thing is the time bottleneck. Because when you, when someone dies, you have a donor, right? And Mm -hmm. everyone has to get there at the exact right time, collect the organs that will go for donation they have there has to be a patient ready to receive the organs within hours and very often there are things go wrong livers hearts other or thing things go bad and things get destroyed accidentally or because there isn't enough time to get from one part of a city to another part of a city or from one city to even another city so this could potentially get past a lot of those bottlenecks and cool. fix the problem. Liver for life. Yeah, I'm a fan. What do you have, Justin? Uh, let me see how quickly my story loads first, and then I'll tell you if I got uh, how long this takes because the uh, Wi-Fi. Oh, here we go. I'll start with this one. Uh, this is proteins extracted from fragments of a prehistoric eggshell found in Australia. Confirmed that the continent's earliest humans consumed the eggs of two-meter-tall thunderbirds. These birds that just uh, went extinct about 47,000-ish years ago. This is in the Journal Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. The eggs came from Jenny Yornis, a huge flightless thunderbird with tiny wings and massive legs that roamed prehistoric Australia in flocks. Would it be... Still be flocks if they're flightless. Could it be herds? I think it would be herds if it's a maybe it maybe herds. What would you say for ostrich, Blair? That's a great question. I still think it's a flock. A flock of it's a Just bird. Of the but, feathers. Yeah. Hmm. We'll figure it out. Yeah. Uh, fossil records show that the thunderbird uh, thunderbird stood over two meters tall, weighed between two hundred and twenty and two hundred and forty kilograms, which is that's a lot. That's a big bird. Big. Uh, the laid melon sized eggs that were about one and a half kilograms each. And so the earliest day date that we think, uh, Australia got populated by current modern humans about 65,000 years ago would have been the, maybe the, the furthest back, uh, currently these burnt eggshells date to around 50 to 55,000 years. And that's not long before this giant bird went extinct. And it was about the time when humans had spread across most of the continent. And these eggshells are actually found in locations all across the continent. However, there is no sign of Thunderbird butchery anywhere in the archaeological record. So they were too big to hunt. But these, but the, uh, but the nest rating of the giant eggs was a productive behavior, at least for the humans. They could get away with that. 
although it wasn't sustainable because obviously the giant birds went extinct. Researchers are pointing out that the Geniornis egg exploitation behavior of the first Australians mirrored very much early human ostrich uh, egg grading activity. And that's something that's uh, in the in the archaeological record across Africa, dating back at least 100,000 years. So the peoples who eventually populated Australia were probably not that far historically removed from the uh, from people who were doing ostrich hunting in Africa. But the difference is likely the reproduction rates. Mm. The ostriches and humans coexisted with this egg stealing uh, behavior throughout history, but the same level of exploitation with this Thunderbird by the early Australians may have been too much for the reproductive strategy of those birds. And uh, that's probably why they went extinct. So it was just that the birds weren't reproducing quickly enough. So there weren't enough eggs to feed That's the possible. hunger of the growing yeah. population of humans in Australia. That's that's, that's what basically. it's one of the possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Do you it think, was, it's do, kind of, I mean, it's if it was if it's people, I'm going to say, well, you know, people, they're gluttons. They like the big eggs they are going to go eat as much as they want. Not worrying about that kind of thing. But I also wonder, you know, is it population balance? versus or is it i don't know what they wanted to eat but look at that <laughs> how at could what? you take how could you take the thunderbird's bird's egg we're looking at an artist rendering that i think is very very cute um, <laughs> uh, two but, meter tall thunderbirds yes yeah, so very adorable. scary so adorable uh, not adorable scary when you think mm. about that both yes. can be true um <laughs> But I'm surprised that 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 they weren't able to to protect their eggs. I mean, ostriches are very good at protecting their eggs. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's bitterns. why ostriches still are here and thunderbirds are. And, and it that may that may have been a thing uh, as well. There's also that weird that weird habit that uh, animals have of of learning to be afraid. Uh, not it's not weird, but they learn to be afraid of humans to an extent. Where when then there's a, a predator human arrives to a location where the animals haven't seen humans before, they're, they're maybe not as afraid. Now, it might not still have been worth fighting a Thunderbird or trying to hunt one, but they may have been able to just walk up and take an egg. The, the strange no thing about the Thunderbird and the Dodo, though, is that I understand they didn't know humans before, but humans have a lot of telltale signs of predators. They have the binocular vision. Um, and so I just, it's like, you know, we, we learned on the show about how babies have an innate ingrown fear of, of snakes and spiders because of uh, evolutionary reasons, because of venom and these sorts of things. A lot of animals have instinctual response to anything that acts like a predator. So why is it that these big, beautiful, dumb birds did not recognize a predator when they saw yeah. one? And they may have, like the dodos, though. The dodos, I, the dodos didn't have predators on the island. There were none. Uh, but the, yeah, but the Australian mainland definitely had predators. Yeah. Like that, it wasn't pre sure. a predator-free zone. Sort of interesting. Some of the ways that they were able to identify that this was the bird that they were looking at was the shape of the eggs, the dense, the, the thickness of the shells, but also they they were able to pull proteins that were preserved within the shells. Oh, so, you cool. know, the shell was uh, within the layers of the shell itself. There were proteins captured, um, although most of their genetic analysis came back as chicken. <laughs> Uh, which they believe is a is contamination and not a relation. Yeah, uh, most not likely. a close relation to a chicken. <laughs> All right, Blair. Yeah. What do you want to tell us about, or are you chicken to tell uh, us a story? No, I, no. I I have poop for you, not chicken poop, but uh, polar bear poop from All right. Toronto, <laughs> from a zoo. And this is a study looking at the accumulation of contaminants in the body. 
And this specifically is looking at polar bears because they are very good bioaccumulators. They're at the very top of the food chain. They have a lot of fat and they are very good at digesting and eating fat. And that's where a lot of contaminants hang out. So they were a good study species. But this is really generally looking at how to study contaminants in any animal. And so looking at this uh, in the, you know, in the past, looking at contaminants, you would need the animal to be deceased and you would need to check tissue. The way to study biomagnification, really the only way historically has been through dead tissue. So you can look mm -hmm. at the contaminants in there. The method that they developed here was specifically looking at poop, which is something that you can get at any stage of life from lots of different types of animals and learn a lot of things. Our poop tells a big story. No matter how big the poop is, poop you're tails. a polar bear. Yay. The poop is quite large. Uh, but <laughs> what they were able to tell looking at an animal that they knew was going to have high bioaccumulation of contaminants, is they were able to track the amount of polychlorinated biphenyls, PCBs. They are um, outlawed uh, in pretty much the whole world, but they, they, are, they have a really long latency, so they hang out for a really long time. And so um, they, this is something that is important to be looking at at polar bears, in other wild animals, and in humans. Because even though this stuff isn't supposed to be used anymore, it's still hanging around in the atmosphere. Or not in the atmosphere, in the environment, excuse me. Um, and so the previous studies have linked PCBs in wild polar bears to lower levels of testosterone, which can impact reproduction. And these it, contaminants can have all sorts of impacts on any types of animals. Um, but what they were able to find out is that because of the way bioaccumulation works, the fact that like if a big fish eats a small fish and then a, a, a seal eats a bunch of fish and then a polar bear eats a bunch of seals, that is a um, exponential growth of the amount of this contaminant into their body. And that was passed along into their feces. So they, you know, they weren't able to make any large scale declarations based on this study about, you know, what the PCBs are doing or like what kinds of, what individuals had more CB PCBs than others or why that might be. But really this was just a proof of concept that you could accurately test PCBs and potentially DDT through the digestive system. So this is something that could help with the study of captive animals, wild animals, and humans in the future. Well, we know that like heavy metals and other things that uh, women who are pregnant are told not to eat too much tuna. And, yes. uh, you know, it's because of this uh, bioaccumulation and that it would end up accumulating uh, in your tissues, but also being passed along to the fetus. And mm -hmm. so... You know, we, we've known for a while that we can sample poop to learn a whole lot of things. But I think this is, yeah, what's interesting here is that they can start actually specifically looking for these really potentially dangerous compounds, long lasting compounds in the environment and seeing how they're affecting the food chain. Yeah. 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 So the poop tells the story as per usual. <laughs> Now I'm replacing Depeche Mode songs with lyrics with poop. And okay, that needs Good. to stop. <laughs> or continue. <laughs> or continue. We'll sing those songs in the after show. Mm -hmm. Ha ha. I'll keep that one in my head to myself. You can imagine what I'm thinking, what I'm imagining. Okay, what do we want to talk about next? How about some electric fish? Because I know this conversation is electrifying so far. I'm in a weird mood tonight. I don't know. As long Should as you're electrified. The Should I say you're welcome? You're good. <laughs> Just a All right, so the fish, not the poop. Not the poop. No. Hey, we're, we're trying to do a tight 90 here, folks. Uh, do you mind if we move <laughs> along to the next story? I know. <laughs> You've I'm got trying. a lot of I'm jokes trying. you've been I'm trying, trying to work out. Uh, I'm trying. I'm trying last here. Week. I'm, I'm really trying. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, electric fish. How'd they get to be electric? 
Oh, that's actually uh, a very they, interesting question. They bit into some wires under, no. under the no, water. No, they didn't just plug and, themselves in. Uh, that actually, is not robots the way it happened. Okay. <laughs> um, some sort of uh, electrified algae. Ooh, high <laughs> iron <laughs> content in their diet. <laughs> No. Superpowers. Well, Superpowers. Let's, Superpowers. let's go, go with okay. adaptation and evolution. Oh, we're that, gonna, oh yeah, yeah. That'll, yeah, that'll we're gonna go out. we're gonna go with with uh mutations in particular segments of DNA, kind of like an epigenetic control, where in control regions of genes for a sodium ion channel that's normally in the muscle. It normally has a couple of copies of these in the muscle and they get turned on. The sodium ion channels are really important to make the muscles contract. But in certain copies, through evolution, these electric fish species manage to, in a couple of different ways, so there's, a, there's a bit of convergent evolution happening as well. They, they came to the same solution through different pathways along different lineages. But what happens is there's a little 20 or so nucleotide section that is um, a control seg segment. And if there get to be mutations in that control segment, it turns it off so that that ion channel doesn't make the muscle work anymore. But in different cells in the body, if that is turned off, it leads to electrical ion flow. So the muscles get turned off, this ion channel gets turned off in the muscles, but then these electrocytes in the electric fish get turned on. So it's the same gene, but there's one control segment that either gets removed in some lineages or gets altered so that it basically doesn't work so much anymore, but it works for another function. So no muscle, it doesn't, this ion channel doesn't work in the muscle cells, but it now starts to work in these electrocytes. And the electrocytes allowed the fish then to gain this function. It's just adaptation and evolution. And that's, that's pretty much it. And it's pretty, pretty exciting wild. that they were able to compare the genetics. They were able to compare a number of different electric fish to actually determine that they're not all the same. It's not just one solution that led to electrification, but there are a couple of different solutions. It's either remove it completely, this little control segment, or just mess it up so it doesn't quite work right. But so, in effect, it comes to the same solution. Right. And so there's, a, there's actually, uh, as, as phenomenal as that seems, we also have to remember that the this electrical impulse thing is uh, at least in some of them is used for communication yes and so we yeah. have we have echolocation in dolphins and bats we have speech communication in current modern humans but we have vocalization in all sorts of vertebrates and birds and everything well, birds are vertebrates. all sorts of animals that aren't stuck in the water can use sound which is a thing that you know, even even some right, I can see players say, even some fish are using clickety clackety soundy stuff to communicate. Well, uh, but these I was, fish are like Z -Z -Z zap yeah. zap. What I was gonna say is that at least with terrestrial yeah. vertebrates, my understanding is that the uh, vocal cords have a have a you have a um, a shared origin. Mm. So I think I think that's what's different about this is that they're. Um, and then I guess that's more like the fish you're talking about, Justin, is the vocal cords of, of yes. terrestrial animals versus the clicks that fish make, which they don't use vocal cords for that at all. So I would yeah. say that is a really good comparison in that case. But, I, but I'm, I'm wondering if, if then, like, as this thing evolves along and there's this ability to utilize it, it becomes a communication thing. Because I think of electric fish, I think, all, actually, all I think of is an electric eel. I think of something that zaps its food for to paralysis, right? Like it, it's a weaponized thing is the first thing I think of. But, but there's all sorts of uh, interfishy communication stuff that also is going on with that. I don't know. Right. I wonder how. It, uh, it, 
They use them for hunting. They use it for defense. They use the electric organ for communication. There are all sorts of behavioral uses that came about once they had the had this new mutation, right? This new organ that they could then use. So. Uh, some individuals were able to take advantage of their electrification and use it to their benefit for whichever ways that they could. But it's this, you know, interesting, weird fish genetics that they had two different kinds of sodium ion channels and they had duplicate versions of the same gene so that the muscle cells could do their thing and then it could silence the others and just be like, oh, you're going to do this other function in other cells over here now. But it's just repurposing, evolutionary repurposing. It's this just it, this happens all the time. We're going to well, take this. We're going to flip it around this way. It's like an old T-shirt that you hack up and you make into a cute new, you know, into a dress or something. I don't know. And I mean, I was going to mention fish were the first, you know, big group of vertebrates. And and so they've been around for a really, really long, long time, time. And they've had the whole ocean to explore for that whole time where adaptive radiation has happened over and over and over again. And so it's if you want to talk about a place where crazy permutations can happen, I think fish are some of the best examples of that because they've had the benefit of time and diversity of niches and yeah. Tell me about axolotls. So this Justin. is actually absolutely uh, following on that story of the of, cool. of genes being reutilized in different yeah. ways. Uh, imagine having the ability to regenerate almost any body part throughout okay. your entire body. All right. You hey, a regenerated leg or arm, not a problem. New heart, new lung. Don't wait for a donor. Just regenerate your kidney. Refresh that skin as well and reboot those ovaries if you find the need. Spinal cord got you down. Just regenerate it. And if you don't have a tail now, well, you, you can. Even reversing brain damage is possible if you're an axolotl. The, this is a nearly extinct Mexican salamander that has these all of these amazing regenerative abilities. Pretty much all that we know of them and study from them is uh, like a hundred, I think it's a 150 year old sample that was uh, taken to, to Paris and has been built up as a, as a research colony over the years. Remotes that have been genetically engineered. It's a very important step in doing much animal research. Uh, this is this is our cloned mice that have knockouts or have been selected for a specific gene trait. They can be uh, genetically altered to have fluorescent tags on some genes, which allows them to be able to be studied to see how cells behave uh, that are connected to certain genes. So all of this is ex extremely important for research, but there's been few transgenic axolotls available to use in these studies, despite potentially holding the key to regenerating every body part and immortality and the fountain of youth simultaneously, which is important because if you live forever, but just continue to get more old and decrepit, it, it, it might not be worth it at some point. Yeah. Uh, but that's changing development of these new tools to work with the axolotl. Uh, they say is, has now elevated the level of established research models and positioning the community of scientists who use them to a functional research model with exponential growth potential. And uh, following two studies that are just published this month in the, the edition of Developmental Dynamics. And this we're only two days into this month, so it's... You know, very recent. Uh, this is <laughs> quoting <laughs> Prayag Murawla, a scientist at the MDI Biological Laboratory in Bar Harbor, Maine, saying, uh, with these tools in place, we expect to see exponential growth. We only need to look at other animal models to get a sense of the variety of topics that can be studied. Most axolotl research is now focused on limb or tail regeneration, but there's also the opportunity to study regeneration of the brain heart, lung, spinal cord, and more. We are not running short on biological questions to investigate. Which actually, that's the one, that's the one thing that made me sort of like, like I get 
I get the body needs to heal damaged tissue. But what happens if you regenerate a brain? Are you still you? Do you do you have to fill it all up again if you have like a really bad brain damage? Or do you have to start over? Are you the Are you same talking person? about Theseus's ship right now? I feel like that's what you're talking about. About what? Wait, Theseus's what ship. If Who's... you if you if you change every uh, plank of the ship over time as it rots. Yeah, At is it still point, the same ship? Yeah, is it the still? Is it a new ah, ship? This well, no, that's exactly and that's and about. that's okay. It is because you know every human body part is like a body part, like a machine, like a like an arm. You give me a new arm, it's just a new arm. I lose my hand, I get one of those Luke, cool Luke Skywalker hands. <laughs> Not a problem. Yeah, you know, ah, the heart goes bad. Put in a monkey. Uh, a heart with a pacemaker, it's abst- It's just a part you're replacing, or it's a part that needs to get healed or whatever. But the brain, that's what I'm talking about. That's the thing that I think is me, right? Your, <laughs> whole, the- th- your whole self is you. I no, mean, your, it's your brain's things, interaction. Your brain care. remembers that your brain has all the networks, but the brain is connected to the body. So it all works together as a system. So if you replace parts and regenerate parts, the brain has to learn how to talk to those again. If you regenerate the brain, the whole brain has to learn stuff all over again. It, it's always going to have to right. refigure unless unless we get to the point where we're just like choop, scanning brains and choop, uploading consciousness into brain kind of thing, which we definitely are not yet. The, the ship of Theseus, by the way, I think is a, a terrible argument. <laughs> Look, have you ever had a car? Yeah. Either of you, have you ever had a car? This is a simple question. Just, oh, yeah. yeah. I use yes. my car okay. until so, it is limping. And you changed parts and it was still your car. And then one day you got rid of that car and you got a different car. And guess what? That was your car. Not a single part from the old car went into the new car. But that was still your car. That's not the argument. <laughs> enough. Enough, enough already. All right. So axolotls they're going to be the key to our regeneration yeah and now we have uh, we have a generation uh ability to make models with the proper knockouts with those tools which was lacking which is going to allow research on on one of the most yeah yeah, what one of i think one of the uh the greatest potentials for uh for disease management because as we're, we're as we talk about any disease, we're talking about a cascade of negative events that have taken place, and it's causing downstream effects from where yeah. the disease starts usually. And if there's a way to trick your your body into regenerating the the original factory part <laughs> and rebuild it, uh, that's huge. Stronger, faster better okay or just as fast just as strong but what if, no better than before and it would still be fine but I'm what sure. if you were a clone uh-huh. and that you, your clone just kept cloning and cloning and cloning until you were one clonal organism that was 4500 years old and lived over 180 kilometers under is this a forest of he, she's like, talking about the michael keaton film what, multiplicity hungry? right is that what she's talking about? i feel like this is like either some pine forest or some fungal yeah. spread in uh, no in, so not a fungal so. spread so we've talked about before the largest organism on the planet it could be an aspen grove it could be a fungus here in oregon um However, Australian researchers have located what is now thought to be the largest plant on Earth, and they estimated at 4,500 years old, and it is seagrass. It's (laughs) under about 180 kilometers underwater and all underwater, Um, and they have determined through genetic analysis first they were like oh let's go find out how many different kinds of seagrass are down here and see how they're evolving and then they're like oh my goodness it's just one organism it's all the same and you've got me and you got me right away because i was immediately when you said plant the first thing i thought was like where could it be that it has never there's never been a fire because like some of the oldest growth trees are you know yeah, yeah, because they haven't had a fire in a long time. But still, and it's seagrass. Yeah, like a landlubber. 
<laughs> uh, they've published their research and proceedings of the Royal Society B on this single plant, a clone of the seagrass Posidonia Australis. And this is in the World Heritage Area of Shark Bay in, oh, <clears throat> in West Western Australia. So this is fascinating. They have determined, however, that there are areas within the 180 kilometers that have adaptations and variations. And so its genes do appear to have uh, resilience and that they are well suited to its local but also variable environmental conditions. And that there are these little subtle genetic differences within the clone that allow it to exist across this range, even though it's a clone. It still has little tiny differences. Um, but now there's more research to go in to determine how the plant survives, how it thrives, and um, how it really has lived for so long. What made it special? Cloning, really, but... <laughs> Cloning and, but also I think uh, uh, going back to my, the plant living with, uh, without having to encounter fire, uh, a, a relatively consistent biome, yes. you know, if, if the environment that your niche really works in doesn't change for 4,500 years. Yeah, but that's the thing. It has changed in 4,500 years and it's managed to survive. And so what they are saying is that it has these subtle genetic variations and also this variability has allowed it to be resilient in the face of change. And that's what they are going to investigate further. See, this is better. your real ship of Theseus because as it clones, <laughs> at what point is it no longer the same individual if it has cloned itself and there's slight genetic changes over time that's what humans are isn't it i mean that's our same thing we don't how, clone ourselves how ah, we, okay so it's not one individual becoming another one individual it's two becoming one which is no, like but there's not that far away it's a huge there's a there's a there's a, an huge. almost infinite number of different combinations that you can have in all of your different, you know, kind of matchings of, of chromosomes. And in this case, you have, it is like 99.9% .9 exactly the same, except there is a slight difference. So like, right. yeah. well, that's just because we're, we're used to uh, thinking that's the complicated way because we're earthlings on Omicron Perseus three. <laughs> it takes 30 to have one baby. 30 have to right, get together to right. make one offspring. And it's a mix of all of those genes. So that's... Is it, you know, there's a novel. Maybe it's Vonnegut. I don't know. But there's a novel somewhere where um, there's extra dimensional beings that actually are part of human uh, recombination mating that we don't know about. Because we can only see... I think that's... No. <laughs> I think that's the best. I do. I think it might be a Vonnegut. I don't Vonnegut. want anybody else involved in that except, you know, the child in the end. You're you're done. Okay. You're go grow. Be a, be a thing. All right. We have finished our first set of stories. Thank you for joining us for this, this issue, this weekly episode of this week in science. We hope you're enjoying the show so far. If you are, please tell a friend today to listen to twists. All right, let's do a few COVID stories. You want to talk about COVID? COVID! Really. I suppose. The story we don't want to talk about. Um, okay, so this one's kind of, it's COVID related because of its impact on our health moving forward. So the pandemic has led to people in isolation, we have been wearing masks, people have been social distancing, we've been washing hands and doing all sorts of things that have reduced other illnesses, flu, respiratory syncytial virus, the cases have gone down, down, down. And then uh, what we've seen is that uh, there's a new study, it just published uh, in Nature Communications on off-season Respira respiratory syncytial virus infections in Australia after the easing of COVID-19 restrictions, which led to 
off season. So if these colds are usually winter colds, that's when we normally get these rhinoviruses, these syncytial, these syncytial viruses. Um, they're now in the spring and the summer and not during periods of time when we normally get sick. And so the circulation of the viruses in di are different. And in fact, with genetic sequencing, sequencing, they revealed that there was a major reduction in the RSV genetic diversity following COVID-19 emergence with two genetically distinct clades circulating cryptically. So they were like hiding in there. Um, probably localized in very small regions before an epidemic surge came out after the COVID-19 cases, COVID-19 control situation was relaxed. Uh, they say there also are, is the possibility of some uh, viruses maybe going extinct. And that would be nice. there might be there, yeah, but there are others that are still circulating. So of course there's going to be new cold viruses and other things, but it just highlights the need for continuing surveillance and sequencing of these other viruses. We've also seen um, hepatitis that has killed some children in the United States and around the world that we don't know the cause of the hepatitis. And it's thought to be related to uh, an adenovirus and a, an adenovirus that would normally not be a problem, but that potentially is more dangerous because of the lack of exposure in the previous uh, previous years or because of the immune system kind of losing hmm. its responses over the last couple of years. So there are some very interesting questions now as to how, as we get through these pandemic waves to come, as we you know, slowly over the next couple of years kind of make our way out of this pandemic what will be happening with other viruses that um that we normally see as seasonal will covid itself become seasonal will these others become sporadic and difficult to predict will winter colds come back and just be winter colds again or and how long is it going to take before the ripples of all of these experiences end up becoming a still pond again I'm curious if there are people, especially children, that did not get their vaccines on time for, for sure. other things. Absolutely. Because yes. people were very concerned about going to medical facilities. People were told to, to um, put it off during surges. Now it's really difficult to get appointments because everyone's starting to go back. I'm yeah. really curious to look back at that because I think um, it's it's it has to have impacted vaccine schedules for children for yes, things besides COVID. Yep. Absolutely. So there's going, there are going to be some interesting just health, uh, public health ramifications over the next decade or so, not just from directly related to COVID, but also these kind of off target effects of the whole pandemic. And, yeah. and what's happened. Yeah. I just got my Tdap booster after 10 years. I got the, the notification. Like, oh man, really? It's been 10 years already? I don't know that I've ever gotten a I don't even know what the Tdap is. You probably got a Tdap. You you had a child. Tetanus, diphtheria. Oh, tap, tetanus shot. I've gotten that one. Something in Tdap. They put it all together. Pallidum I don't know. <laughs> I'm not a doctor. <laughs> okay. Um, as we are going back through COVID waves, we know that one of the places or one 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 type of place that has been a problem for uh, infections has been the gym. People going and <sighs> working it out. Yeah. Breathing very heavily, but there's been a question as to exactly how much aerosol is produced by different individuals during the course of exercise. And so some researchers decided to throw a bunch of people on uh, treadmills okay. and measure don't, the aerosols that they produce. Don't tell me the answer. Don't tell me the answer. Okay. Because yeah. I have like been during this whole pandemic, we'll be out in public. And once you're out like in the free open air, you take off the mask and you're like, ah. Oh. I can breathe without a mask, not close to humans. And then some jogger comes by and you're like, oh, God, why did you have to run by me? Because you're breathing heavily. But then yeah. I'm also thinking if somebody's doing heavy breathing all the time, haven't they kicked out 
enough virus if they had it even like that they would be there would be le- I don't like think I don't it know. works that way I don't think I it works don't that know way how that works. <laughs> it doesn't yeah, work it's all that gone. way they used it up right well <laughs> or was it I just it, blew yeah, it all but, out I mean is there like a, <laughs> not that it would be gone but is it like less than somebody who wasn't going for a jog and breathing on you well like, anyway. what they what they determined that uh For untrained people, the uh, respiratory volume increases from from 5 to 15 liters per minute at rest to over 100 liters per minute when exercising. And highly trained athletes, because they have a higher volume of oxygen that they take in, that actually reaches up to 200 liters per minute. Yes. And then, uh, and so this is respiratory volume and, uh, what they've correlated that to for, of course, is, um, the amount of aerosols that are expelled during exercise. So if it's the kind of exercise that really like a little light jog, if you're not really well-trained, you're going for a walk or maybe a little jog doesn't really get you breathing that much. It's not a big deal. If you're going for it and you're Puffing, puffing, breathing. That huffing, puffing, breathing is producing a lot more aerosols. Um, And the reason that this in particular is important is because as we go through waves of increased uh, of increased COVID transmission, it's good for gyms to know, Okay, people are working out really hard in our gym. So we need to open the doors. We need to increase ventilation or we need to take all of this. We do. We do. hit. We do hit training or, you know, boot camp or whatever. Go outside and work out outside where there is a lot more air. Um, you know, so it can help protect people. Uh, if people who are fitter, younger, fitter, uh, and they're in the gym, they can wear a mask to protect others from their increased aerosol expulsion if they are going to be working out at a higher rate. Um, you know, so it just it helps gyms make decisions it helps public health uh in yeah, professionals well, make I, decisions it's and good. i can give yeah. a couple of examples uh both the treadmill and the exercise bike are simulations of an activity you can actually do outside 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 that's uh, how those started and then somebody said we can't charge for that so they created a way to do it inside so you could have air well, there's, conditioning. There's also places where like <laughs> your sneakers would melt if you went for a run outside. Outside. Yeah. So it's yeah. you know, there are Pakistan's certain things. like 120 degrees right now. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. There are certain things that you can't do outside all the time. It's true. But these things are important for for public health and to maintain things. Hey, Blair. Yeah. Did you get a chance to look at the uh, update for the the COVID sniffing dogs? Yeah, I did. And uh, they're good at it. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what we said before. Yeah. So this is, I think, the third time. I tried to find the other stories that we reported on before. I had had trouble finding it. But um, the, the latest one was back in December where they found that uh, dogs were better than antigen tests at sniffing out COVID. Um, this, but this, is a, is, this is also the story that I've never believed. So in this one, let's talk about that for a second. Yeah. This one was looking at samples from 335 people. They trained dogs to sniff out um, coronavirus cases based on sweat or other bodily fluids that were put you know, into a container. And then they smelled a cone that kind of um, directed that smell into one place. And so they were sniffed out 97% of coronavirus cases that had been identified by PCR tests. And they found all 31 COVID cases among 192 asymptomatic individuals. So, yeah, so they were actually very good at detecting asymptomatic individuals, which is exactly where dogs could come in handy in places like airports, concerts, yes. sports events, because the people who feel well are going to come. And so <laughs> the dogs could sniff them out and they could be pulled aside. And so this is part of the thing, Justin, is even though this article is is suggesting that they're actually as or more effective than the tests that we use, um, this could be used 
to identify an individual to then take a rapid test and then be identified what to do based on that. Because no matter what the science is telling us, people are still very dubious of dogs in this regard. Now, one of the um, researchers mentioned that people don't think of dogs as high tech the way electronic sensors are, but they argue that dogs are one of the highest tech devices we have they're biological sensors instead of electronic sensors. And if you t- if you trust a dog to sniff out bombs or drugs, why would you not t- w- allow a dog to sniff out COVID? It's the exact same chemical processes. Um, I'd love so. to know, you know, what subtle shift in our aroma gives it right. away. Like, what is it? Like, what changes in our sweat or just... I would, that right. that to me is so fascinating. Yeah, what is and it? this is what we don't know. Um, and part of the the crazy thing is you can use odor from body sites at different locations on a body, different types of odors, and all of them can give this information. So it doesn't appear to be a single hormone or a single chemical. It really looks like a pattern of increasing or decreasing certain smells in a person who is carrying a disease. Because also remember that like body odor is completely dependent on genetics, what kind of yeah cleaning solutions you use, how often you shower or change your clothes, like all sorts of crazy things that can impact your particular flavor. I'll say. Um, But the dogs can still tell if your flavor is off and you are therefore carrying COVID-19. So um, this really is looking like these dogs are extremely effective and they hope to start using them in these larger arenas. Some since the um, December uh, research that we reported on have been used at concerts and large outdoor events to great success so far. Um, But the real problem is that there's actually um, a supply chain issue with dogs. There's not enough dogs to do what they currently do, detecting explosives and drugs. There are so now to get them to detect diseases is a whole extra problem. So the 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 issue is we have lots of dogs in the United States, lots of dogs, too many dogs. Spay and neuter your pets, but ultimately. Um, The problem is in training. It takes a lot of time and care to train dogs. Not every dog that starts training finishes training. Not every dog that is successfully trained in a closed scenario can can then perform public. Yeah. In a public space. So, so because this is, this is one of the things too, when I, when I, when I, whenever I look at this is uh, the, the drug sniffing dogs, I get, they can absolutely do that. But then the ones that are being deployed by law enforcement across the United States are worse than a coin flip, apparently. Like they're actually pretty bad at it. And a lot of a lot of their their Real indicators world. that we don't see are false hits because the police officer has a bias and wants to right. and it, have a reason to search a car. Yes. And then they don't find anything, but it doesn't end up in the report. So like they, there's always it, it's training. But like you said, yeah, even if they got trained out into the real world, how well is that And that's the other maintained? piece, training the handlers, right? Yeah. And so yeah. if you have dogs that are um, part of a uh, organization where the handlers are also trained and deployed and part of a specific group, then it can be easier to kind of um, do this. So there's actually... Uh, There's organizations that take rescue dogs, for example, train them to do a job like smell out invasive species. And then the organization with their rescue dogs are sent out to areas to work. So this is this is what the dogs that I was talking about that worked at the outdoor concert uh, earlier this year. This is how they worked. They were from a company. So it's, it's tough. It's harder when you include law enforcement, because then you have somebody who's their main job is not trained to be a dog trainer. Their main job is in law enforcement. This is another piece of that yeah. job, but it 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 muddies the waters. So this is definitely something where there's a lot of variables, just like there's a lot of variables when you have a, um, a sensor that you could be using or not using correctly, right? So yeah. it's it 
yes, it's not a perfect system, but these dogs seem to be very effective at smelling COVID. I, I feel like it's also going to be the Good consistency doggy. of the work because I feel like airport sniffer dogs are probably getting a high volume of traffic and are probably catching three or four people or, uh, or isolating several probably dozen pieces of luggage uh, a day, if not an hour, for traces of stuff, right? But then you, you go out, like, you got the dog that you're going to use for the event, but there's not an event for the next month. And so you do some training, but then you're like, oh, he looks hungry. I'll give him a bone. Anyway, suddenly the training, like, so, you know. <laughs> Justin, it's, oh it's my the, God. It's the consistency of, of keeping that training as part of the behavioral reward system. Which Right, which they usually do with these animals. Yes, they but try to. They, but would not, do. they try to. So like the they would do. Dog, yeah. I see but working all day long. That would be Any the other whole scenario, point. I feel and like And they would do the that. Best. And that's what you pay them for. Yes. You know what? <laughs> we pay the dogs? No. You know what? This is This Week in Science. Thank you so much for joining us. And... You could pay us to do this if you like us that much. If you like Twist, head over to twist.org. Click on we our Patreon it. link. And you, too, could be a supporter of Twist. We are listener supported. So your donations monthly, whatever amount through Patreon, allow us to do this show for you. We really appreciate your support. We can't do it without you. Let's come on back right now for that lovely part of the show known as Blair's Animal Corner. With Blair. Yeah. She loves our creatures, great and small. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. What you got, Blair? I have baboons. Yikes. Yes, oh. baboons with special male friendships. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, so baboons, um, specifically guinea baboons, live in really interesting uh, societies called tolerant multi-level societies. They have core units consisting of one male and one to six females, and they're young, so far sounding familiar in terms of many things that we've heard of in the animal kingdom. One male, many females, and the young. Several of these core units all form together with some bachelor males that have formed their own party. Two or three parties team up as a gang, and then all the offspring are fathered by male, the male, the main male representative. That is the core of the unit while bachelor males hang out, but are not sexually active. So they have this big society formed of these smaller parties, which are formed of smaller core units. Confused? That's fine. Just understand there is a male with a bunch of females that are essentially, they're his for a mating season. Um, they live adjacent to other similar groups and there are bachelor males hanging out in the area. Hopefully that makes more sense. It's good to be the top baboon male. One of them. One. In a, yes, there would be a bunch in the area kind of saying, hey, so, but staying in their own spot, right? Um, so what this study is looking at um, from the German Primate Center, the DPZ, which I'm guessing is the, the Deutschland Primate Center. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> um, they uh, wanted to look at the bonds between males because they seem to have a really strong bond with one another with no rank hierarchy when these males form these friendships. So why would they do this? Is Does this help their mating success? Does this help their survival? Why do they have the, these male friendships when ultimately there is going to be one male that is in charge of an entire group of females? So how how is there a benefit here? This is something you don't often see in groups where you have one male and a bunch of females. So what they found was that there was no benefit to male reproductive success in having male friends. 
In that, fact, that that tracks. Sure, yeah. <laughs> in fact, once the males associated with females and began to have babies, they spent less and less time with their buddies. Yeah. Right? Yeah, that, that tracks. tracks. Can relate. <laughs> uh, although males in their prime maintained some social contact with other males, they adjusted their investment of social time according to their life history stage so that they could maximize reproductive success, which meant paying attention to the females and their own babies. So there's a bunch of theories. Do these male friends provide emotional support? Do they help in defense of females against rivals if another core male is trying to come over? If you're friendly with some bachelor males, will they help protect hmm. the other females that you have? Difficult to say. One thing we know for sure, it does not make them more likely to have babies. Um, so one of the ideas that might be happening is that this just allows them to hang out near these other animals, which allows them um, overall fitness success because they don't, they're not off on their own. They're not going to go die by themselves, right? So basically just being friendly with one another allows them to be part of this larger, looser social group. They looked at the social behavior of 30 males, determined the paternity of 50 infants over four years. They um, looked at over 400 individuals in total starting in 2010. Um, and there, yeah, so th there was, there was no reproduce, there was no reproductive impact. There was no evidence that males with friends had, were more attractive to females. It wasn't that they were getting paid more attention to. So really just young and old bachelors have time on their hands. And they hang out with each other because they don't have females to hang out with. So and it's... maybe they've got buddies and it keeps them from being in trouble. Like, right. Oh, here comes a predator. But now there are more of us. Yes. Or, oh, we've got more access to food. And yeah. Yeah. So buddies it really just good. feels like. I, I feel like it's more like eh, females don't want to hang out with me for yeah. some reason. Hey, me too. Oh, OK. Well, yeah. I guess we have something in common. So it's definitely a function of this strange society shape that these baboons have is it allows for, you know, in, in gorillas, for example, a lot of the time you'll see bachelor troops. So you'll see just a bunch of males that aren't paired off all together by themselves, not near females, not near successful males. They just hang out and do that for a while until they can find a place to go to take over. Similar with a lot of hoofstock, lots of, um, you know, giraffes and antelopes and stuff like that will do this too. They'll have their little bachelor groups. Um, but in this case, because they have this larger, more tolerant social structure, they're, they're allowed to hang on. And because of that, it allows them to have this very funny interaction where they have this friendship with other males. And then all of a sudden they start to become the big man on campus and they don't have time for their buddies anymore. <laughs> oh yeah and so the, and the buddies are like oh he never has time yeah, for us anymore never has time for he yeah. never picks the bugs out of my fur anymore i really miss him Aww, what's up with that guy back. uh so maybe next steps maybe when he gets older and he gets ousted uh next steps for this study is to look at whether male friendships help to attract first females earlier or maintain status as a reproductive active male for longer. So while as they haven't found statistical significance with the number of offspring or mating success, uh, these are the next measures they want to look at. Are, does hanging out with men and having friends and social interactions, does that make them better at interacting with females? Does it help them to hold on to their leadership role for longer? So these are things that they can look at. i got to say, if it's anything like humans, the answer to whether or not hanging out with their buddies makes them better at, at attracting women is going to be a no. 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 <laughs> uh, you know, unless their like, friends are real allies, women, really evolved oh, yeah. individuals, right. you know, evolved baboons, intuitive. Yeah, it's hey, it, yeah. hey, you know, I heard, uh, you know, a thing I heard about uh, what the ladies like. Oh, what's that? 
Yeah, apparently they're into uh, uh, when you bathe. <laughs> oh, that's weird. Yeah, who, who's ever who's ever heard of a thing like bathing before? Yeah, no, I know, but that's apparently what the ladies like. Oh gosh, I wonder if we should try that. Nah. You know what? You know what females really like, Justin. <laughs> what? Females really like it when you move your petty palps. When you uh, when you have your 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 legs, you you tap them, and then they you drum your forelegs with really quick speed, and then legs, you have really got the- you have baseline Ooh. tremors of your abdomen. You slap your abdomen on the ground a bunch, and then uh-huh. transmit that sound those 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 baseline tremors through your eight legs into the ground. Make the ground shake, and then eventually make the female shake. Hey, you know, I I heard I've heard another thing about what ladies like. Oh yeah, what's that? Well, it's gonna take four of us. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Or (laughs) or you could be a wolf spider. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So in for wolf spiders, some of the secret of courtship is simply having the most complicated dance. Uh, This is a study looking at male. Skyzocosa stridulens spiders, which are a type of wolf spider. And what makes a successful dance? So in this study, they deposited a female onto filter paper of a soundproof chamber a few minutes before they introduced the male. Then the team recorded ensuing courtship with the help of a camera and laser vibrometer. I love Ooh. that. That that method is so cool. Yes. Yes, I want to, I want to hear, I want to see, I want to feel. By shining the laser down at a piece of reflective tape stuck onto the filter paper, they were able to analyze vibration-driven changes in the frequency and other signatures of the reflected beam so that they could capture every little bit of signal from a male as he danced. (laughs) What they found was that the more complicated the more vim and vigor in the dance, the more successful the performance. These could last five minutes or up to 45 minutes. Can you imagine watching a spider dance for 45 minutes? I mean, I could. You I could. definitely could. I Get that. me the popcorn. Actually, but... I, I think I, I would be done. <laughs> but I also <laughs> watch frog videos for several hours at a time. So I'm I've gone to a modern dance concert or performance before, which lasted, I think, for... Uh, I feel like it lasted like eight hours. Yeah, I'd rather watch a spider. Yeah, me I too. Think, than that. Yeah. This sounds like a modern dance performance. That's on point, which is much harder than it was. That was like tap ballet. Yes. How do you lace up eight little bitty ballet shoes? (laughs) Amazing. (sighs) Um, Well, anyway, uh, they looked at 44 of these performances. Nine of the males were awarded with copulation. Um, They also had the most complex courtship signals of the bunch. And um, this was held across three different measures of complexity. These measures were previously used, you gotta science, to characterize binary code, bird song, and whale sounds. <laughs> there were All no right. previous models to study the vibratory signals of arachnids and their associated complexity. Mm-hmm. Yes. So they this is a very interesting way to to turn this just like, wow, that looks like a wild dance into actual like math and numbers and something measurable that you could then do something with, do a science with. So <laughs> the, the, so there's, there's a couple theories as to why more complex signals would be the desired trait. We ultimately don't know. We're not in the female wolf spiders glob of neurons that they have. It's not quite a fully 
it's brain, whatever brain. The glomeruli. But, yes. Um, but one, you know, the, the most common answer based on a lot of Darwinian theories would be the more complex signal takes energy and time to produce. And therefore that, that is a signal that they are more fit. They are more doing something harder and something that would actually call attention to predators and not dying means you are the cream of the crop and you should be allowed to mate. That is the very, very baseline. Like the law of the jungle. If you can make a lot of noise in the jungle and not die, then you're great. This is peacocks. You got a giant (laughs) tail on you that makes it harder to fly and slow. So if you have a huge tail and you haven't been eaten, there's something special about you. (laughs) Um, But the other idea is simply that uh, females are bored. They're so bored of it. They just see the same thing over and over and over. And so anything novel would be something that they would be interested in. So uh, this is, yeah, increasing complexity, especially through time is as if the males are changing things to keep their interest the interest so so the females are like yawn snore same thing over to what is he doing this is a very weird dance and sound he's i've never seen this before so Next it's thing yeah. we know the spiders are going to be like mockingbirds and they're going to be making car alarm sounds and yeah. <sighs> you know what i was thinking about actually was about the fashion industry and how when you see the runway, you see the absolutely crazy fashion choices that designers make. And you're just like, what is this? <laughs> it's, I think it's, Not. it's my, my mom used to always say to me, and I was like, what is with this new stuff? She would say, you know, they're just trying to be different. Like different is eye catching. Different is interesting. And so mm-hmm. just try it. It's very smart, right? So th- that's exactly what this is. You know, it's, it's it, in humans, we do our own version of peacocking or spider dancing where we're trying to stand out in the crowd. We're trying to do something different and daring. And so maybe that's all this is, is they're just trying to move around and, and look crazy enough to get lucky. Somebody notice me. See this crazy work. thing I'm doing? Look what I can do. <laughs> Doesn't work out for a lot of kids. Look what I can do. All right. Moving on. What can you do, Justin? What stories do you have? Uh, uh, there's a couple of uh, stories that I still have to do uh, to talk about. Uh-huh. But my computer's slow. There is a 3,400-year-old city under the waters of Kurdistan that has been revealed thanks to climate change. Atlantis? Climate change, climate change is revealing all sorts of stuff. There's all sorts of ice patches that are melting and there's artifacts coming out of the flows. This one is thanks to a drought. Major reservoir, so that's water levels drop like a rock due to an extreme drought in Iraq. And the waters receded enough to show that an ancient city was underneath. It had a palace. There was massive fortifications with walls and towers, a multi-storied storage building, and an extensive urban and industrial complex were attached to this thing as well. So a team of German and Kurdish archaeologists raced in to document as much as they possibly could of this emerging city before the waters returned, and that was really their timeline. The waters have exposed this city under a water reservoir, and yeah. it's going to rain again, right. and the reservoir is going to rise again. So here's your timeline now until when the thing fills up again. So working under this pressure, the researchers mapped out the city, and then they actually started getting some pretty insane finds from their excavations. So uh, there were these amazingly well-preserved walls. So these were several meters high, which is not bad because these are sun-dried mud bricks that have been underwater for about 40 years now. Uh, part of the good uh, preservation is because the tops of these walls had collapsed and covered buildings. And there was like this earthquake that happened 
three thousand years ago that caused an earthquake for these the tops of these buildings to fall. So you have these you have these buildings underwater covered by other structures, other other earth. The most amazing thing that they found there were ceramic vessels with over a hundred cuneiform tablets. These are sort of hieroglyphic oh, wow. language tablets. These date to the late Middle Assyrian period, shortly after the earthquake. So that's about 1350 BC. So you've got written texts over 3000 years old, written in hardened clay, and they were enveloped in a soft clay. Because apparently that's how you used to send letters. You would take your hard clay thing that you baked in the sun, and then you'd take soft clay around it to hide what it said, and then you'd hand it to the postman or whoever who would deliver and then whoever got it would like peel off all the soft clay to see the letter beneath. So they got a hundred of these. And then those they obviously of, weren't writing on paper yet. They yeah. didn't have the paper, <laughs> the, at least not, at least not here in, uh, in, in uh, Kurdistan. Area. Yeah. So, so then these are in these vessels. They got stored in there. Then they were in a building that then got buried by a wall that then was under water for four years. So, it's amazing, amazing that they're now in the hands of archaeologists. The rising waters have returned. The excavated <laughs> buildings, uh, they were they were complete. They were covered with uh, this sort of tight-fitting plastics. They poured gravel on top of that to hold it down. And they're now waiting for, you know, probably not to, to too far off in the future time when they're able to get back to the site and do some more digging. But they've got hundreds of these tablets that they can now decipher, and they're they're likely they're likely very domestic communications, mm -hmm. which is, is is probably going to give a very good uh, indication of daily life because these are cool. sort of randomly taken from households uh, and storage areas. So they might be they might be business transactions about goods yeah. coming in and out. They could be interpersonal communications. It's going to be really fascinating to see what the results of these are. And that'd then be, that'll be wonderful. Amazing. Thanks for and that. And then yeah. uh, halfway around the, the world, a network of lost ancient cities in the Amazon was discovered by flying lasers. This is, this is entire cities and networks of cities under centuries of wild growth, hidden by, hidden by, uh, beneath thick tree canopies in the forests of Bolivia. These cities, built between 500 and 1400 AD, had elaborate and intricate structures, unlike anything that they've discovered in the Amazon to date. These are five meter high terraces. They say it's covering 22 hectares. I have no idea what a hectare is. But apparently, according to this, it's equivalent to 30 football pitches. Don't know what a football pitch is, but if it's anything like a soccer. football field, <laughs> soccer, like 30 soccer fields, uh -huh. there was also 21 meter tall conical pyramids that were discovered. So this is how, also how intense the, the forest canopy is to hide these things. These are extremely difficult areas to ex access for an archaeological survey by foot. This is this is the machete all day long, and then you've gone 10 yards into this forest kind of a thing. So they flew LIDAR detectors, which is basically laser uh, stuff that shoots through all, ignores all of the foliage and shows the hard structures beneath. And it showed this amazing, intricate... Uh, there's, they found vast networks of reservoirs, causeways, checkpoints spanning several kilometers. And this is, uh, let me find it, 600 miles of canals along raised causeways connecting sites to reservoirs and lakes. This is, this is a much more intricate water delivery system than California currently has. <laughs> uh, just really amazing. Research is published in the journal Nature. The, the LiDAR technology dubbed lasers in the sky, able to peer through the tropical forest canopy and examine the sites found in the Savannah Forest in the South Amazon. This is an area. Uh, this is an area at the same time that they say these cities were being built and these networks and all this water infrastructure was being built. 
The seasonally flooded Amazon savannas were being transformed into productive agriculture land in a, in a region that is roughly the size of 90 Rhode Islands, as we Americans would put it, or, or as the British would say, one jolly old England worth of territory dedicated to agriculture in this method. So, yeah, co-author Mark Robinson, University of Exeter, adds, our results put to rest arguments that Western Amazonia was sparsely populated in pre-Hispanic times. Absolutely. It sounds actually like one of the, the biggest archaeological, uh, excuse me, biggest uh, agricultural sites on the planet at that time. So how old is this again? This is uh, uh, from 500 to about 1500 AD. Okay. Is when it was it, when it was operating. So yeah, about uh, about 1500 years old is when it when it began. When it was built. Yeah, I was just trying to place it in terms of like Roman aqueducts and and other you know technology. Like you're making fun of California right now, but in ancient times. We've been we've been pumping water for a while and mm -hmm. the Romans get all of the get all of the the glory for their, yeah, and, for their and water it's systems. The, but, the yeah. other things that they sort of point out in this, that the the cities and the way that they were designed, constructed and managed was very much with the the natural uh, the natural landscape in mind. So they employed, there was, there was sustainable subsistence strategies. There was conserving nature areas within the living areas of the people who were living in those urban landscapes. So that you, you know, there was no point anywhere in how they designed their city where you were completely isolated from access to nature, which is what you used for subsistence. They're very different than, than you know, the current modern city design. Where let's keep nature completely out of the city, despite still relying on it entirely for our subsistence. Right. We'll bring it in. Bring it's it in. Part of what it's part Cosmos of who we are. Aqueduct. Yeah, it's all of it. That's so cool, and I love also the fact that it probably allowed much larger populations to survive than mm -hmm. we previously considered. These kinds of findings make you start thinking so much more deeply about the where and the when and the how and <sighs> it's getting late, isn't it? Hey, Blair, when do you exercise? Like what time of day? At 5.15 in the morning. 5.15 in the morning. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Justin, do you exercise? <laughs> Why? Why? <laughs> Just getting out of bed. It's uh, exercise. That's uh, about all the heavy lifting I'm going to do. Mm. Yeah. I used to, when I was young, my exercise was all at night because it was after, had to be after school. So it was like evening, 5 to 8 p.m. kind of exercise time. College was that a lot also. It was like the only time in the evening when I could finally make it happen because I'm not a morning person, mm -hmm. unlike Blair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there is this question about the ideal exercise time of day. Is there a best time of day to exercise? Well, according to a new study in Frontiers in Physiology, researchers took a group of uh, what did they have? They, oh, where'd their sample size go? I just looked at their sample size. They took a group that wasn't as big as I think it should have been. <laughs> as is usually the case with human studies. <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. They started with a total of 140 women and 63 men from Sarasota Springs, New York, who responded through emails, flyers, and local newspapers to advertisements regarding their exercise study, ended up with 59 women and 30 men being screened and finding 30 females and 26 males who ended up being eligible for participation in this particular study in which they split the groups in half and they had half the group do morning 
workouts and half the group do nighttime workouts. All the workouts were assigned and they were exactly the same. All of the people had to be a fairly fit level of baseline fitness so that it wasn't like, oh, we've got a mix of different fitness levels. It was just, let's get that control factor taken care of already. And 12 weeks later, they had the results of the study. What they found is that while both times are good, exercise is good regardless. Mm -hmm. Morning I, exercise. I'm still waiting for the, yeah, I'm still waiting for the study. It's like, turns out exercise is actually bad for you. You should Yeah, stop. that hasn't come out yet. That's not the one that <laughs> we're talking not, about here. Nope. But I love that they still point out every time. Any level of exercise is better than not. Please ah, just get off the couch. <laughs> that's what they're Pretty saying. Pretty much. Or even if you're on your couch, lift your feet if you can. Do something. Do a couple ankle lifts. If you can. Yes. Uh, Move your ankles, roll your wrists, stretch, stretch. Morning exercise reduced abdominal fat and blood pressure in women. And in the evenings, the women who worked in worked out in the evenings had enhanced muscular performance, but didn't have the same reductions in blood pressure or abdominal fat. So morning is good for bellies and blood. Evenings is good for the muscles, according to this study. In the men, evening exercise increased fat oxidation and reduced systolic blood pressure and fatigue. And so uh, in this also, when uh, there is a particular aspect of uh, benefit to to mood, the evening exercise didn't have the same benefit to mood that morning exercise does. Well, I guess that makes sense because you go to bed right after. Mm -hmm. You get Maybe to do your muscle sense. recovery. So the muscles that you, you yeah, broke so down, the physiology of this might sleep. make it a lot of sense. It all kind of makes yeah. sense, yeah. Yeah, now, except this wasn't night. seen in men. It this was not the same. It wasn't the same result in men. So oh. women had this split result. Yeah, morning work, morning exercise had a different result than evening. Men, they just found that this evening exercise increased fat fat oxidation, oxidation increased systolic blood pressure, and uh, or reduced it and reduced fatigue. So the the key to this study is that there were a lot of factors that they couldn't control. Mm -hmm. and that they didn't control and they they know that and it wasn't a, a really big study so we have a very limited sample size which could also impact the results because you also have uh women's menstrual cycles and there were also uh peri and post menopausal women right. in the study that as was well one thing i was going to ask yeah yeah so there's a lot of stuff in yeah. there uh -huh. especially on the 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 women's side for for that um and there are, could be a lot of things to explain the results, but what they suggest is that this kind, this result could be used to uh, to optimize your individual exercise health benefits. So if you're looking for reduced blood pressure, then you know, or exercise Workout in the morning, yeah, or mm -hmm. or in the evening for uh, for men, or the afternoon, and so yeah, so exercise, it's good, but. The exact time of day might be different yeah. for different people and for different reasons. Just and of, of course, um, I read this story to Brian last night. And as soon as I was done reading it, he goes, so what does that mean for me? Because I work nights. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. It's all <laughs> messed up with that I circadian rhythm. Yeah. It's because yeah. who knows if it's that or if it's about when, you know, when, when you're eating light out or when you're eating yeah. or when. The, yeah, I have no, yeah. I don't know. I don't there know. Are, so, but he also amazing. like this is also like a whole thing anyway, but like <laughs> a whole separate thing. But like he has a job that is not sit arounding. Right. Right. Yeah. So so like there's a like if you have a job where you're on your feet all day, you probably you're don't exercise. need to go to the yeah. gym to yeah. get the cardio, what's it yeah. stuff happening. If you have a job where you sit all day long, mm -hmm. you probably really need to do one of the treadmill things one of the two morning, morning or evening 5 or... 15 yikes <laughs> or get one at your desk i don't understand how come people don't have like like uh, uh in place unicycle that they can type at oh yeah you know? do something if you're gonna have to sit there all day yeah Jeez. oh but what about 
What about what happens when you take antibiotics? Have you ever taken antibiotics and just not only had it affect your appetite, but maybe it made you feel a bit tired and just not energetic? Yeah, but you always wonder, is it because you're taking antibiotics because you're sick? So is it the sickness Mm -hmm. or is it the antibiotics? Exactly. Well, some researchers just published a study in the journal Behavioral Processes in which they weren't looking at people, unfortunately, but they decided to look at what happens with gut bacteria in mice after 10 days of antibiotics. And so they believed that an animal's collection of gut bacteria, its microbiome, would affect digestive processes and muscle function, as well as motivation for various behaviors including exercise and dun 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 the study reinforces their hypothesis so they found uh in their groups of mice they separated them out uh they one group of mice was bred for high levels of running activity so they were very active mice and some mice were not so they're a little like more normal sedentary mice Uh, Neither had any signs of sickness. So they were all very healthy. um, And then they were given the antibiotic treatment. Again, no signs of sickness. They seemed all to be fine. The athletic mice suddenly stopped. Well, they didn't stop running, but they reduced their activity in the running wheel by 21%. Just out of nowhere. The high runner mice didn't recover their re- running behavior for 12 days after the antibiotic treatment was given. So there was a sig- and in, in mice lifetime, that's like two months <laughs> because their met- metabolism is so much faster. But the way that they think about this is that a casual exerciser uh, and, and additionally, the behavior of the normal mice wasn't affected as much during either treatment. So normal mice, they did reduce their activity a little bit, but not to the extent that the athlete mice did, the runner mice. And so what they think this implies is that normal people going about their lives, if you don't consider yourself an athlete, you're probably not going to be affected too much by antibiotics and it, it the effect on your microbiome. But they suggest that potentially world-class athletes might have much larger setbacks from a course of antibiotics for an infection that could really affect their ability to uh, to compete and perform. But we don't know because we haven't looked at it in people. It's just in mice. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, the difference between competing uh, elite athletes, if you're talking two, three percent difference, even like that, it becomes significant. Whereas uh, you know, the difference of 3% and two couch potatoes is still two couch potatoes. That's how right. it's going to, that's how it's going to break down. Is what I'm trying to say. It's like volume, it's volume down. and percentage things are relatable. Yeah. And in this, what they want to do moving forward is pretty much uh, figure out what the, what the metabolic signals are. So the microbes are in there. What are they doing? What are they breaking down? What metabolites are getting sent into the bloodstream or what nutrients are not making it into the bloodstream because the microbes are dead and not in there? Uh, You know, what aspects are there and is there the possibility of pinpointing specific bacteria for increasing athletic performance? And you, this is not specifically to enhance athletic performance of athletes, which you would think might be interesting. They're suggesting enhancing uh, performance of uh, for people who uh, can't move or if there, is, there are risk factors of, you know, if you don't exercise, risk factors for mental health, depression, physical health, all sorts of other things. Um, but if people who are unable to exercise as much, but you can get benefits of good bacteria. Yeah. That that yeah. respiratory rate though of the pro athletes from like I think the first story tonight. Yeah, the 200 like 200, right? Liters so per minute, yeah. In that you're also talking about a transport of nutrients that's going to yeah. be a much Massive. higher. Yeah. Uh mm-hmm. and so and so that the not having the conversion rates taking place in the gut that you usually rely on 
to feed that transport system, to feed muscles and feed energy levels and all this stuff that's going on. Yeah, that can be severely impactful. I still question how much it will affect those who who are not uh, how, how, how it would like like this study said. You know, not much of a difference in people who aren't exercising a lot. But I'm I'm not sure that that's the best route to. Uh, but what it, so what it what it you know so for there's the extremes right so if you have yeah. a bell curve or a distribution then you have people who are the average it's not going to change or affect much but the people on either end any changes could be very significant to okay. their to their performance so yeah. this this also reminds me of another story which I didn't bring tonight so I will I will mention very briefly but it's related to this it's that in a uh, in a survey of I looked it up 551 primary care physician uh, clinicians mm -hmm. uh, with a bunch of hypothetical scenarios of when they would or would not administer antibiotics, 71 percent of them in the survey indicated they would prescribe antibiotics to someone um, where they have bacteria present in their urine, but there are no symptoms to suggest an infection. So 71% of mm. these respondents would give antibiotics to asymptomatic individuals. So th this is it's just first line of defense. Relevant just kill the bacteria. <laughs> even though that the, that is a counter indicate it's like, it's not counter. It is against the recommendation mm -hmm. of when to prescribe antibiotics, not just because of antibiotic resistant bacteria. And that's, that's its own huge, huge kind of like sort of Damocles mm -hmm. over us for the future. I don't know what's going to happen when our antibiotics don't work anymore. But, um, aside from that, this could have other impacts on, on someone's body. If you're prescribing antibiotics when they have an infection, but there's no bad symptoms, you could yeah. put them on antibiotics just in case and cause all sorts of other problems. Mm -hmm. We don't want to cause more problems. No. We want to cause fewer problems. Yes. Yeah. And we want to give you as many directions to find your answers as possible here on This Week in Science. Mm -hmm. Have we made it to the end? I think, I think we so. did. I think that was all of the stories that I had to talk about mm -hmm. anyway. I think that's all my stories for tonight too i have one yes. oh no i'm kidding that's it oh blair you always oh did. they sequenced the genome of people in pompeii they oh, did this, uh, how did they do that well they did you should look that one up that's yeah look it up <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you everyone for listening we hope that you enjoyed the show let's give some shout outs to Fada, thank you so much for helping with show notes, show descriptions over on YouTube, social media. Very helpful over there. Gord, R and Lore, others, thank you for manning the chat rooms and being there to make sure everything flows nicely and people are kind to each other. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. And Rachel, thank you for editing and for your assistance. And to our Patreon sponsors, thank you for all of your support. Thank you to Teresa Smith, James Schofer, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rick Loveman, Pierre Velazar, Ralphie Figaro, Ron, John, nah, deep, blah, deep, bloop, blah. John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Karen Tazi, Woody MS, Chris Wozniak, Dave Bunn, Vegard, Chefstad, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, a.k.a. Don Stylo, John Lee, Ali Coffin, Gaurav Sharma, Ragan, Derek Schmidt, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fred S104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles, Jack, Brian Carrington, Mac Bass, Vote Beto for Texas. John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hessenflo, Gene Tellier, Steve Leesman, a.k.a. Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan, Christopher Rappin, Dana Pearson, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Remy Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artie on Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, John Rodney Lewis, Paul, Philip Shane, Kurt Larson, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthan, Steve DeBell, Bob Calder, Marjorie, Paul, Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Peckerauer, Tony Steele, and Jason Roberts. Thank you all for your support on Patreon. And if you would like to support us on Patreon, please head over to twist.org and click on that Patreon link on next week's show. We will be back 
Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific Time, broadcasting live from our YouTube and Facebook channels and from twist.org slash live. Do you want to listen to us as a podcast? Uh, maybe while you reorganize your closet? Just search for This Week in Science or podcasts are found. If you enjoyed your show, get your friends to subscribe. If you enjoyed your show, this, this show, show we do for you, get your friends to subscribe as well. <laughs> For more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes, links to the stories we referenced will be available on our website, www.twist.org. You can also sign up for a newsletter, maybe occasionally mm -hmm. sometimes. It'll it'll pop in there when you least suspect it. <laughs> you can contact us directly, email Kirsten at Kirsten this week at science.com, Justin at twistminion at gmail.com, or me, Blair at Blair Bazz at twist.org. Just be sure to put twist T W I S in the subject line. It'll be biomagnified into many trophic layers until it is pooped out by a polar bear in Toronto and looked at by a chemist, but not by us. No, I will no. not be looking at that poop no. or that email. You can also sling some uh, ping us on uh, Twitter where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jackson Flying, at Blair's Menagerie. We love your feedback. If there's a topic you would like us to cover or address, a suggestion for an interview, a haiku that comes to you in the night, please let us know. We'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, remember it's all in your head <laughs> this week in science this week in science this week in science this week in science is the end of the world so i'm setting up shop got my banner unfurled it says the scientist is in i'm gonna sell my advice show them how to stop the robots with a simple device i'll reverse global warming with a wave of my hand and all it'll cost you is a couple of grand Science is coming your way, so everybody listen to what I say. I use the scientific method for all that it's worth, and I'll broadcast my opinion all over the earth. Cause it's this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. this week in science, this week in science, this week in science, 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 science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news, that what I say may not represent your views, but I've done the calculations and I've got a plan, if you listen to the science you may just yet understand. Your philosophies. <laughs> it's the after show. Operatic after show. Bow 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 bow. Bow 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 bow. Ba 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 ba. Ooh, Noodles got twist mail from Zazzle. I hope you like it. That's awesome. Whoa, oh. Ha! For a second, I didn't know what was going on, and then I realized it's after show, so the desk is coming down so Blair can sit. I sit. <laughs> uh. She sits. Ah. <sighs> Sure does. Hello, science fans. We lost a grouchy gamer and a Kevin <sighs> Reardon earlier. Bloop, bloop. We gained a Derek Schmidt. We've got a Noodles. And yeah, Identity 4, it's me. It's me who has the, the window noise problem. Hmm. Windows, Windows was making. It's never done that before. I thought I had them turned off because I don't like those noises. I don't understand these computer things. Whoa, I don't need four got inspired and started exercising. Yes. Nighttime exercising. Decrease that blood pressure. Systolic BP. Ha <laughs> ha. 
How's it going, Blair? Pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. How about you? It's pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. It's good. My dad is home. Yay. Yeah. I'm very cool. happy. He's home and healing. It's good. Kira is still here. There you are. 12.53 a.m. I'm yawning here, and it's not even 10 o'clock here yet. I'm like, oh, oh Pacific <laughs> time. It's it's rough. I created an earthquake. <laughs> oh, man. Oh. Yeah, I think Justin has left to go to a party. Well, I'm sure he will be leaving to go to a party or something. He may, I don't know. He's staying, at, he said he's at an Airbnb. Justin is. <laughs> yeah, Derek Schmidt. Yay, 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 yay. Well, my dad said that he was feeling better except for the pain. <laughs> Yes, that sounds <laughs> like uh, you leave you leave the hospital and they take away the the big painkillers. But yeah, it's yeah. great. So we hope hope Dad will continue with all the healing, so yeah. he can give everyone good trouble huh. for a lot longer. Good. Yeah, that's every once in a while. Good news. We can take it when we get it right little bits of good news yes definitely your dad's probably sleeping right now or i'd say hi blair's dad oh yeah probably <laughs> they usually watch the beginning of the show yeah <laughs> don't always make it to the end no oh fada you're gonna stay up for strange new worlds huh oh, i hear boy. that's a good new series enjoy why am i yawning oh oh because i got up early this morning so i could watch the cavley awards announcement huh and the cavley awards are uh the cavley institute is a norwegian institute and so the awards were in norway time and so they started at six o'clock this morning so i woke up i woke up you were probably exercising when mm -hmm. i woke up this morning blair mm -hmm. that's true <laughs> my alarm goes off at 502 and 507 ouch i am running by sometime between 515 and 530 i have to put in my contacts brush my teeth oh my god put on running clothes yeah, see look at me i'm i'm yawning because i'm like oh leash up sadie up, who's not woke interested. up at 5 30 and then rolled over in bed and turned my iphone my not my iphone right. my android on <laughs> watch it on my phone yeah. oh dad's awake <laughs> dad, dad's awake hi dad <laughs> hi mom hi dad <laughs> Bazderich. <laughs> Mom Bazderich is probably asleep. Yeah. Mom and she Dad wakes Baz. up very early. Oh I don't no. Like that. Mom Mom Bazderich is awake. <laughs> <She's> oh. <laughs> They're both awake. They're like, we're watching you. We see oh, you. Yeah. Well, it is summer break for my mom, so. Oh, it's time to go crazy then. Yeah, she can stay up be, late. She'd be staying up late. Oh, yeah. goodness. Yeah. <laughs> I know. What I go to bed at nine o'clock on normal nights, on non twist I nights. I keep you up. This is your, your one time shifted night. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Derek Schmidt, what is very early to me? Good question. Well, before I got this job that I have now, anything before six o'clock was insane early. Um, mm -hmm. but, uh, my, my mom still beats me sometimes. She will wake up at like four 30 sometimes. And she just, some people need less sleep and some people just, I am a I person need more. Who, yeah. I, I am usually <laughs> I asleep, asleep within five minutes of my head hitting the pillow wow. and I do not wake up. If I wake up during the night, I'm wrecked the next day. But, uh, but yeah, my mom's somebody who just like never, she often does not sleep through the night. She wakes up a lot. That's always been her deal. She often sleeps less than seven hours <laughs> and so she'll wake up at four, wow. four thirty, and just be up. I want to know if your mom has one of the early bird chronotypes. Oh, probably. So I, I knew a guy who, who had this, uh, whatever the chronotype is where he 
like would never sleep more than four hours a night. And this is this is a guy who went to school full time, worked a full time job, yeah. was raising kids. Like he was yeah. doing, and and then would like go Fine. hit the gym and hit like yeah. and do like the long distance bike riding stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, uh, one of my professors was like that. He got four hours a night. I go for a brisk walk in the morning and then uh, have to take a nap. Yeah. Like right <laughs> well, see, after. and naps, naps and me do not get along. I cannot nap. A nap will ruin oh, I, my day. I, I can't ruin. help but nap anymore. I used to never, but now it's like, oh, it's part of my daily routine. I need a, I need a nap in the, like middle of the day. Well, you're probably getting woken up in the middle of the night also. I'm not a sound sleeper. This is also true. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Yeah. I So uh, Brian will often nap from like 9 to 10 and then he'll go to work. Yeah. So uh, he, I mostly don't notice when he leaves. <laughs> Every once in a while I'll be like, oh yeah, I remember when you left, but... <laughs> Yeah, you're like no. I'm Usually, we fall asleep together at nine o'clock, and then I wake up in the morning alone. <laughs> and that's it. So, it's amazing he can take a nap like that. Oh yeah, but, but, uh, uh, but uh, we yeah. should stop talking about all of the sleep because uh, I am in a different time zone than I yeah. usually inhabit, and I am now ready for bed at a reasonable hour. You uh, are? Yeah. You're not going to go out partying? No. With the oh, Davis, gosh, no. the La Davis no. locals? You're not? No, no. <laughs> Have you I'm, already done that? <laughs> I'm so done. I am so done. <laughs> so early. Like, this is now past my bedtime uh, coming back from the other time zone. This yeah. is way past my. This is when I was waking up. To, I would wake up to do the show when I was there. And now that I'm here, it's past my bedtime, and I, I I really need to go to bed. Justin, I just think you're confused. This it is the... very confusing. <laughs> no, <laughs> very the light and everything. Yeah. Oh, but as everybody in the chat is saying, Lady DePaul, Twist has me up past my bedtime too. Worth it. Ah, oh, yeah, good. That's right. It's always worth Kira, hanging out with this crowd. Derek, yeah. So, Justin, are you around in the U.S. for one more week? Or uh, about that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, I'll will still you be, be able to make the show next? Oh, week? yeah, should not be a problem. Okay. Yeah, but uh, it will be at a different location. So, as we discovered, there is a slight delay in the Wi-Fi here. It could get better or much worse next week. I don't know. Yeah, I'm I think it's the, gotten better over the over the show. I'm at fine. the mercy of the uh, whatever the the Wi-Fi level uh, has, that has been supplied. Wi-Fi mercy. <laughs> Which is also kind of weird because I'm six thousand miles closer than I usually am. <laughs> <laughs> you would think. No, you'd think it would be uh -huh. it doesn't make any. To, any something to do with proximity <laughs> would be involved but no. nothing nothing, nothing to do over. with proximity no. <laughs> oh my goodness that's funny oh what was i thinking you Doodly didn't doodly say doodly. it so i didn't I'm, i don't know i know oh uh Ju oh, i got an email from uh Eugenie Eugenie Scott hmm. who is uh with the National Bay Center Area. for Science Education mm -hmm. National Center for Science Education she's not there anymore but used to run that and mm -hmm. uh she is part of organizing SkepticalCon which is oh. this skeptical we went there once. We did. We yeah, did, we did. We did a live show there we, once. I think yeah, it was pre Blair. Once. Yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. Um, which means it was more than a decade ago. You're welcome. <laughs> a while ago, uh, this will take place on the weekend of July 16th to 17th, um, and she said it'll be internet based, and she wanted to know if Twist would be interested in exhibiting it at Skeptical this year. Absolutely. Um, so we'd put a 
thing. I'm always could, down for that. Uh, venue. We could maybe make a short video Every for their years. website. I don't know what that means. I think it's just online. I don't know if we would have to be in it, but we would get uh, a free registration to the conference. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, that and would I think, be cool. I would love to attend, but but also like I, the, the like there's there's always a ton of things mm -hmm. in the venue of sorting out what is uh, rational, useful thought and the insane nonsense that our pop popular culture propagates. Yeah, I feel like I I'm ready to do uh, a rant. Or a presentation, oh, rantiness, <laughs> uh, uh, about about the entire ancient aliens thing, about the use of archaeology as propaganda versus as a fact checker for things. Yeah, um, that'd be cool. I would, I would love to do one of my favorite things. I would love, really love to do, is do a suspension of all doubt when it comes to UFOs. And analyze it as if all of the witness accounts that have been uh, thrown out there into the and to, through the public uh, were were correct, and what that would have to then mean. That would that would it was it would be uh, suspending doubt for the flow of the information coming in, but then apply a skeptical reasoning. To what that would then have to mean, and just and that one's one of my favorites because every almost every single accounting of what an alien looks like when people have had a, a close encounter in Ben is a hominin. It, it's it's. <laughs> have you have you seen the <laughs> uh, like hominin? Have you seen the opening for this last episode of Saturday Night Live? Yeah, I've seen. Yeah, I've seen those. I've seen those. Yeah, 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 yeah. Really, really funny. I think it's the only funny skit in the entire episode. But it's really, that's usually how they like open really with a good funny. one, and then it's just like a downhill slope for the rest <laughs> of the. But that's also like a, you know an important thing. Like the 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 accounts of probing sound like like wow how why would they come halfway across a galaxy or whatever to, yeah they have to like finally probe humans like essentially like a, yeah they have like a warp technology but they can't yeah. scan your internal organs without well, sticking something up but your rear end but again if you <laughs> if you suspend all doubt and accept that then you can say Oh well, they needed a sample of the microbiome, which is something you would want for any you species. You would want a you microbiome sample, yeah, of course. Right. You'd have to yeah, probe course. pretty far. Uh, well, you need a roto rooter, right? Because because well, you so not necessarily the the, the microbiome in the gut like Good is Lord. different at different sections, right? So like the the, the microbiome in the stomach. Uh -huh. Is a different group of bacteria. Than yeah, the but there's enough evidence, I think, in the colon in that the you could... large versus the small intestine. I don't know if it would all be right. But the but small intestine the and the large intestine are definitely going to. Can be I give different. you my conclusion yeah. real quick? Because yeah. because <laughs> if they're hominins and they look like humans, they evolved on planet Earth. And wherever they, you know, people are like, oh, all throughout history, they show up and have abducted people. Even the ancient Greeks have reports of the... They're molmen. So their technology never changes through time. They look human and they're getting gut samples. Their future microbiologists, after antibiotics or some disease has wiped out the microbiome and they need to go get the paleo microbiome to replenish. So that's just Very future good. humans. But then you have to think, what about you know all the, the paleo paradoxes? diet is just a fad. What you about all the paradoxes of going back and, and interacting with the past? Well, yeah, if you went back and interacted with the people of Pompeii, it'd be no problem because you know what's going to happen. Now you're what's just stealing Doctor Who stories. That is a Doctor Who. Uh, no, is that Doctor Who? Is that <laughs> yes, oh, it's that's Doctor Loki. Who. No, that's it's... Loki. Loki's like does all this crazy stuff where he's like showing up and like, I want to say he goes to Pompeii and Doctor Who too, right? No, he they they do they do that too. 
but uh, and in fact, it becomes the twelfth Doctor is uh, one of the people they interact with. The actor they bring back to be the twelfth Doctor, but it doesn't matter. My, the point is, uh, if they're from the future and they're willing to like interact a little haphazardly with people of our time, it means something really bad is going to happen and create a massive bottleneck, and none of us are going to be included on the other end of it. Right? <laughs> There's also like if you really if you really take if you take anything suspend all doubt and then apply a skeptical analysis to it you can come up with a result that's very different than uh, uh than the unskeptical eye approach anyway those would be fun things to do but i gotta go so it would be uh, fun i'm gonna oh, say good night blair gotta go oh okay oh, good night blair okay. say good night justin good night justin <gasps> Good, Good night, night. Kiki. Kiki. Good night, everyone. Thank you for another great show. Glad to see you safe and sound here in the U.S., Justin. We'll see you again next week. Everyone, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay curious. We do hope that you will come back again. Bon 